from the Library of Congress in Washington, D.C. And good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to the African and Middle East Division of the Library of Congress and to our noontime lecture series with Dr. Nubia Kai's presentation today on the oral historiography of the Mali Empire, sponsored by the African section. I'm Joan Weeks, acting head of the Near East section, and on behalf of all my colleagues, in particular, Dr. Mary Jane Deeb, head of, uh, chief of the division, I'd like to extend a very warm welcome to everyone. And before we start today's program, I'd like to give you a brief overview of the division and its resources uh, so that hopefully you'll come back and use this beautiful reading room for your research. The division is comprised of three sections that build and serve the collections to researchers from around the world. We cover 78 countries and more than 35 languages. The Africa section includes countries in all of Sub-Sahara Africa. The Hebraic section is responsible for Judaica and Hebraica worldwide. And the Near East section covers all of the Arab countries, including North Africa, Turkey, Turkic Central Asia, Iran, Afghanistan, the Muslims in Western China, Russia, the Balkans, and the people of the Caucasus. Now I would like to invite Marita Harbert, our area specialist for Francophone West and Central Africa and the Sahel to come to the podium and introduce our speaker. Thank you, Joan. Uh, today we are fortunate to have with us Nubia Kai, who will discuss her new book, Kuma Malinke Historiography, Sandiata Kita, to Almama Somari Torre, the first and last leaders of the Mali Empire from the 13th through the 15th centuries. Her book is dedicated to uh, Diallo uh, uh, Dijama Kuyate, who's pictured uh, on the flyers that you receive announcing this program. Um, Dijama was well known to the African section. Um, he played for us um, in 1997 when the African section um, moved to the refurbished Jefferson Building. And more recently, his son Amadou Koyate played the traditional choral instrument that he learned from his father, Dijama, in a performance sponsored by the uh, Library's American Folklife Center uh, last March. Dr. Kai um, received her PhD in African literature and film from Howard University. She is a poet, playwright, storyteller, and novelist who has won numerous awards for her writing, including three Michigan Council for the Arts Awards, three DC Commission on the Arts Awards, and two National Endowment for the Arts Awards. She has published in Black Scholar, Black World, and Essence Magazine, and several other journals and anthologies. She has two collections of poetry, Peace of My Mind, and Solos. Plays have been produced at the New Federal Theater, uh, the new New Brambra, and several other theaters. She has also taught in the history department of Georgetown, George Washington University, and Howard University's Department of Theater Arts, and the University of Maryland. Please help me welcome Dr. Kai. Okay, thank you very much for the uh, introduction, and thank you for inviting me, having me to come here and do this presentation, uh, Ms. Harper, and the Library of Congress African section. Um, I first would like to uh, do a paper that I did several years ago. Uh, and the title of the paper is Drama Ritual in Theory in Mendinka Historiography. And then I'm going to go on to do a PowerPoint presentation. 
The Mandinka, Mandingo, or Malinke, are well known in the international world as the former founders and rulers of the Mali Empire. In more recent times, as master historians, musicians, and performers. The term griot was popularized when Alex Haley's Roots was published in 1977. At that time, the entire world was exposed to the history of Kunta Kinte, Alex Haley's ancestor, through an elaborate system of genealogical and historical discourse. The word griot is not an African word per se, but most likely a French corruption of the Fulani word for griot, gaola, or the Wolof word galwa. Griot, nevertheless, has become the popular term for traditional African historians in general, and has even been adopted in Western academia to refer to outstanding historians who have excellent memories. Before discussing the elements of drama, ritual, and theory, and its usage in Mandinka history, I would first like to clarify the meaning of the term griot and their function in Mandink society. The word for griot in the Mandinka language is jelly or jolly, as is pronounced in the Western region. And it literally means blood. European scholars have often erroneously defined the jelly or griot as bards or storytellers, likening them to the bardic tradition of medieval Europe. However, the griots have a much broader, diversified, and significant role than that of a mere storyteller. First of all, in the traditional pre-colonial era, griots were the principal political advisors to kings, chiefs, and other high government officials. They were the mediators in international, national, and local disputes. They served as ambassadors and diplomats to neighboring countries. They were the chief judicial advisors and advisors of national defense. They were also the officiators of rites of passage ceremonies, naming ceremonies, puberty rites, marriage, uh, naming ceremonies, funerals, as well as national inaugurations, harvest festivals, religious festivals, sporting events, and other national holidays. They, they negotiated marriage and dowry arrangements, arrangements between the families of the bride and groom. They were foremost historians, archivists, genealogists, social and cultural anthropologists, musicians, and dramatic performers. Training of both male and female griots began at an early age in a peripatetic fashion through close association with their parents and of other family members who were also griots. By the time a griot child reaches adulthood, they have already learned and absorbed a good deal of Mandinka cultural history. Then they may travel widely to learn the local histories of specific regions of the empire and become apprentices of master griots, where they may study anywhere from 10 to 20 years. By the time a griot reaches the last stage of initiation, achieving the title of Inyara or Belentigi, master of the word, they have amassed a phenomenal amount of very detailed knowledge of every aspect of Mandinka culture, society, history, politics, art, genealogy, and in most cases have mastered a musical instrument or instruments, elocution, singing, dancing, and dramatic performance. They are the repositories of history with a repertoire that can fill a library. The astonishing amount of information that the griot stores in his or her brain corroborates the disarming fact that human beings use only 10% of their brain capacity. For the griots seem to use a much larger percent and confirm the seemingly infinite capacity of the human brain to amass knowledge. The griots then are far more than storytellers. They use storytelling techniques, and devices in their explication of history, yet that skill is a drop in the bucket of a multifaceted range of skills and expertise in numerous professions. The musician, 
performer, genealogist, historian are inseparable in Mandinka historiography. The intellectual and aesthetic are inseparable. In a culture where there is no separation between the sacred and the profane, the individual and the collective community, the corporal and spiritual worlds, the historical artistic paradigm is only a reflection of the way art is integrated into the daily life of the people. History to the Mandinka griot is a form of divine revelation, a sacred text that provides human beings with a spiritual ethical map on how to arrive by degrees to their initial state of perfection. Since life in this cosmological scheme is sacred, the recording of social and cultural life is also sacred. Thus, the histories in traditional cultures are denoted as sacred histories. The most important event in history, in Mali's history, in any history, according to the griot Jelijimo Kuyate, who the picture you have there and who I dedicated the book to, is the birth of a child. For when a child is born, a miniature universe is born. Hence, ego, that is the ego that we see in, see in the genealogical charts. The individual is the center of the world and the center of history. How does a Mandinka griot accomplish the task of infusing history into the souls of every Malian citizen? The answer lies in a historiography rooted in a correspondent cosmogony and a deployment of aesthetic devices designed to engage the audience simultaneously at an intellectual, emotional, and spiritual level. Drama, ritual, and art play a prominent role in the daily life of traditional African society and a special role in enlivening, interpreting, and transmitting history so that his, history's powers of transformation are actualized. In order to understand the function of ritual, drama, and art in Mandinka history, it is first necessary to define these concepts from the Mandinka's theoretical frame of reference. A ritual is an acting out of an established prescribed procedure. It can range from a family event such as offering prayer before a meal to an elaborate religious ceremony such as the Kama Blow, performed every seven years in the historical town of Kangaba. But ritual is much more than that. Ritual serves to link the human being in an unbroken interdependent continuum with the material world of animals, plants, and other human beings and the spiritual world of planets, stars, gods, angels, spirits, and ancestors. Ritual enactments reify and reinforce the pre-existing cosmogonic relationship between man, nature, and the universe. For example, a marriage ritual, which establishes a bond between a man and woman and their respective families, is witnessed not only in the human community, it is acknowledged in the natural world and the spiritual world of the gods, spirits, and ancestors who all play a role in seeing that the marriage vows are kept. Similarly, when a child is born and lives through the transitional period of seven days, it is named in an akika, a ritual ceremony in which all of the spiritual forces and forces of nature invoked are obliged to take part in the infant's growth and development. The most important event in history, the birth of a child, is always accompanied with a ritual. And since ego is situated at the center of the world, history is constructed to revolve around ego. Each member of Malian society is made to feel that they are a central part of Mali's history. Through this ritualization of history, that is, the recounting of each person's genealogy and the legacies established by their ancestor at rites of passage ceremonies and various other ceremonial venues. There is no citizen of Mali who does not have eponymous ancestors who took part in the shaping of the empire. The griot recounts an individual's lineage, his significant, the significant deeds of their foreparents, and at the same time enjoins them to eclipse or surpass 
their foreparents in character and deeds. Most often, rituals are enactments of what Joseph Campbell calls living myths. He uses living myths to distinguish them from the connotative usage of myth meaning a lie, a false or fictional narrative. Living myths signifies the opposite of the connotative construct. It is a narrative that expounds the highest level of truth that can be expressed within the limits of language. Bakafen argues that the origins of history can be only be revealed through myth, since in myth lies the beginning of all development. Origination establishes a prototypical model of subsequent development, character, and direction. The primordial power of the original act is recaptured through the narrative performances and rituals that reenact the myths. W.T. Stevenson further explains the primacy of mythological discourse. The essential character of our personal and social lives are shaped by myth or it is by the power of particular myths which determine, by way of determining our fundamental presuppositions, the way we shape our cultural, social, political, and economic lives. We do nothing of significance which is not informed by myth in a fundamental way. And the more significant our act, the more this is true. It is the symbols within the context of myth which give rise to all thought. This is true even in the modern Western context as well. Jung called these, Jung called these symbols the transformers of energy, their function being to convert libido from a lower to a higher form. Marcel Griau, who did extensive research on Dogon Manding cosmology, found that among the Dogon and Mandinka, the symbol not the object is alone the essential quality since it reifies the spiritual potency of an object. The Dogon, a branch of the Mandinka people, configure a network of equivalences between all things through an elaborate system of symbols and myths. The universe to the Dogon is an orderly, synchronized whole, incessantly disturbed, and perpetually reordered along the lines of a pre-existing internal harmony. Myth constitutes the Adunu Satani, the astonishing word, a history of the universe and man simultaneously. The whole is illumined by myth, structures in it appear progressively in time, the one superimposed on the next, each having its own meaning, each also displaying close correlation with the others. That's a quote from Grial and Ditterland. Mythic symbolism attempts to explain the spiritual nature of men and women and their inextricable connection to universal order. In traditional cultures, myths, legends, epics are regarded as real history, while fairy tales, animal fables, trickster tales are generally categorized as fictional. In the modern world, the extreme methodology of Aristotelian logic combined with social Darwinism relegated myth to the fantastic fictions of the infantile primitive mind. Nevertheless, and despite the intellectual hubris that generated the disfigurement of myth, there was an undeniable consensus regarding its transformational power and peculiar ability to shape and transmute consciousness among some of the most influential religious scholars and psychologists. Mercy Iliad, Bakafin, Carl Jung, C. Kerrigan, Sigmund Freud, W.T. Stevenson, and Joseph Campbell turn a psychoanalytical eye on myth and formulated at least a precise explanation of its functionality. The idea that myths are invented in order to rationalize and explain human existence was radically challenged once scholars isolated and carefully observed the cause-effect relationship of myth and consciousness. Joseph Campbell one of the foremost scholars of mythology defines four functions of living myths and their ritual enactments. Quote, 
The first is what I have called the mystical function, to awaken and maintain in the individual a sense of awe and gratitude in relation to the mystery dimension of the universe, not so that he lives in fear of it, but so that he recognizes that he participates in it since the mystery of its being is the mystery of his own deep being as well. The sex, second function of mythology is to offer an image of the universe that will be in accord with the knowledge of the time, the sciences and fields of action of the folk to whom the mythology is addressed. The third function of living mythology is to validate, support, and imprint the norms of a given specific moral order, that namely of the society in which the individual is to live. And the fourth is to guide him stage by stage in health, strength, and harmony of spirit through the whole foreseeable course of a useful life. And that is from Joseph uh, Campbell. In the case of Sundiata Keita, the founder and first emperor of the Mali Empire, his monomyth, that is his personal myth, is represented in one of the most extensive, beautifully constructed and important epics in Africa. Historical myths are direct descendants of creation myths, inheriting their numinous qualities, internal structure, dialectical movements, and revelation of the spiritual ethical norms of the society. Only instead of the narrative revolving around the gods in the primordial world, it is revolved around the culture hero. Historical myths are narratives of mythic proportions and functions, such as the biblical history of the children of Israel, the Bhagavad Gita of India, and the Babylonian epic of Gilgamesh. The predominant venue of expression for historical myths is the epic. Far less symbolic and abstruse than creation myths. Historical myths record history as it actually occurs, though they may be embellished with extended metaphors, hyperboles, parables, proverbs, imagery, symbolism, and philosophical analysis. In the epic, the narrative is usually built around the life and deeds of the hero, the circumstances of his or her birth, childhood, trials, obstacles, triumphs, and, the, and their impact on the course of history. Epics, even more than creation myths, are constructed to personalize experience through the vicarious revelation of the hero whose acts epitomize the most cherished human principles, faith, courage, integrity, generosity, compassion, loyalty, intelligence. Through these virtues, the hero is able to subvert all opposition and obstacles and achieve a personal and public victory. Often, the monomythic journey is a national parable explaining the philosophical and ethical ideas of the society through the life and character of the culture hero. The life of Sundiata Keita is a national parable. He is a leader of men on intimate terms with the gods and possessed with divine qualities that give him a transcendental link between the contingencies of the social world and the world of spirits. Though the epic of Sundi Ada is cast in a secular narrative, there is an implicit religious ideal embodied in the heroic themes, the finite and the infinite. Man's mortality and immortality are brought into conflict with each other through the hero's action. But the two worlds, the material and spiritual, also overlap, and the conflicts are resolved through him, his ideas, Visions, inspirations, and actions come pristine from the primal springs of human life and thought through which society is reborn. Sundiata, the founder of the first and first emperor Mali, overcame a debilitating illness during his youth, evaded the attempted murder initiated by his father's first wife, first wife, Sosumo Barete went into exile for several years with his mother, Sogolon Conde, and finally vanquished the despot, Somonguru Kante, who had ruthlessly conquered and subjected the Manding kingdoms. Under his rule, the Manding kingdoms were reorganized into the great empire of Mali. 
He restored peace, order, justice, and autonomy to the Mandinka kings and established alliances and solidarity with neighboring nations who were installed in the empire. Sundiata's greatest achievement, which until recently was guarded in secrecy by a consensus of Mandinka griots, was his abolition of slavery and the slave trade. His numerous conquests in West Africa were launched in order to enforce the oath of the Manding, the edict officially banning slavery and the slave trade in the empire. Unfortunately, the slave trade and slavery was resumed 20 years after his death, and apparently the national shame of the breaking of the oath compelled the griots to censure this significant event from the annals of Mali's official history. Yet this effacement was public, not private. And initiated griots, the Belintigi, were taught the history but had to swear never to reveal it. Wakami Soko, who was the chief griot of Mali in the 1970s and 80s, the griot from Krina, made the decision to break the vow of silence and divulge this hidden history to a Malian historian, a modern Mali historian, Yusuf Tata Sisi. Uh, Yusuf Tata Sisi collected and published Wakami Soko's text, L'Empire du Mali, Sundiata, Le Glor, Le Glor du Mali, and La Grand Jess du Mali. Excuse my French for those of you who know the language, right? And I want to show you uh, and talk about the Oath of the Manding, or it's also called the Manding Charter. Uh, in the PowerPoint, but I'm going to come back to that. All right, the Epic of Sundi Ada, like the Iliad and Odyssey of Homer, became a major source for dramatic adaptation. Griots dramatized the text using music, dance, and storytelling techniques at rites of passage ceremonies, national festivals, inaugurations, hunting, fishing, weaving, and harvest ceremonies. In Mandinka society, every social ceremonial whether secular or religious, gave rise to colorful, flamboyant, and elaborate theatrical performances that involved the entire community and lasted for days or weeks. As Bilandier noted, everything in them is displayed and performed. Social practices are in a state of permanent dramatization. Ritual drama permeates the society on a daily basis and infuses its members with an experiential sense of history, culture, morality, and spirituality. History, culture, politics, and social practice are consist consistently explicated through multiple forms of dramatic performance. Masquerade, theater, spoken drama, dance, theater, dramatized narratives, recitations, and civic and sa sacred rituals. The epic of Sunni Ada and many other epics popular among the Mandinka are reenacted in all these theatrical forms. Griots primarily recount Mali's history through dramatized narratives. The written wo word holds a secondary place in their historiography. Why? Because the world was created through the word and history is transmitted through the creative word, the spoken word. Thus, history in the Mandinka language is called kuma, the word or word force. The primacy and preference of an oral recitation of history in a culture that has two written scripts. They have the Mandinka script and the Arabic script, but there's still a preference for using the spoken word. It's predicated on the power of the spoken word, which contains an abundance of inyama. Inyama means a vital force or vital energy. And this vital force and vital energy is contained in the spoken word at a much greater level than it is in the written word. So it pervades and effectively impacts consciousness more than a written text. That's why they prefer to use the spoken word. Uh, so the Inyama force that comes from the spoken word, it instills in the audience the mystical function of language so that they know and understand the history experientially. 
And with that, I'm going to uh, go into the amending charter and then talk a little bit more, so some um, photographs and talk a little bit more about some of the principles of their philosophy of history and methodology. Now, this Mandan Charter, as I said before, was a, ch a charter or oath uh, that was constructed at the beginning of the formation of the Mali Empire. And with the information that came out, and this information came out in the 1980s, the secret history was revealed through Wakami Soko. Uh, now, scholars are trying to look it, they have to kind of look at, at, look again at the whole history of Mali because instead of Samanguru Kante, who is the enemy in the, in the epic of Sundiata Keita, he now becomes the hero or is a hero because he was the one who came up with the idea to end slavery in the Mali Empire. And what he did, he tried to call the Mandinka people to arms against the Soninke and against the Moors and other Mandinka who were also trading in slaves. Now this is 300 years before the transatlantic slave trade and it was pretty bad even at that time. And I'm not gonna go into all the details but if you wanna read Yusuf Tata Siti's text that again where he's recording Wakami Soko you can get the text, but they have not been translated. They're still in, in French. Anyway, so Mangrul comes up with the idea, and when the Mandinka refuse to, to, to go along with him in ending slavery, because major, some of the major leaders in the Mandinka were slavers. They were big slavers and slave traders. So they refuse. So, so Mangrul, this is when he launches his attack. He attacks the Mandinka people, it kills nine of the kings, impales their bodies on spikes, makes furniture out of the skins of his enemies, and literally sells the people into slavery. That was his response when they refused to end slavery. That's why in the secret history, he's known as a sacred despot. It sounds rather oxymoronic, but he's called a sacred despot because the idea to end slavery and the slave trade was really some girl's idea. So finally, you probably know the story because the, the Epic of Sundiata has now become part of the uh, literary canon now. You, you're reading it in colleges almost everywhere. Uh, you know the story how he's, he's away in exile because his stepmother is trying to kill him. He's away and the envoys are sent to get him and when he comes back, he goes into, he has this war with someone girl and eventually vanquishes him and then he becomes the emperor. But what happens is, just before his mother uh, passes away, his mother is one, Sobolon Conde, who tells him, look, they're gonna ask you to be the emperor, but before you accept the position of emperor, I want you to abolish slavery and the slave trade in the Mali Empire forever. And of course, he agreed to do this. And so this is what he did. This is why he goes on to this conquest of the outlying nations like the Jalof and Tekbro and other parts around Mali because he knew that as long as it continued in the outlying areas, it was going to infiltrate back into uh, demanding proper. So he creates an empire that was slave-free, you know, an empire where slavery was forbidden and where the trade was forbidden. And this is how the uh, charter goes. The hunters refers to because Sundiata was a hunter. The hunters declare, all human life is one life. It is true that one life may appear to exist before another life, but one life is no more ancient or more respectable than another life. In the same way, no living being is superior to another living being. The hunters declare, all life being one life, all harm caused to a living being requires reparation. Consequently, no one can take things freely, steal from his neighbor. No one must cause harm to his fellow man. No one should kill his fellow man. The hunters declare, 
that everyone must watch over his fellow man, that everyone should venerate their ancestors, that everyone should educate their children, that everyone maintain and provide for the needs of their family. The hunters declare that each guard the country of their fathers through country or homeland. He must also understand, and especially men, that every nation, every land where men disappeared from the face of the earth became immediately nostalgic. The hunters declare, hunger is not a good thing. Slavery is no longer a good thing. There is no greater calamity than slavery in the present world. As long as we are in possession of the bow and quiver, Hunger will no longer kill a person in Mandan. If by chance famine raged against us, war will never again destroy some village to take away slaves. From now on, no one can force a bit in the mouth of another human being to sell into slavery. A person will no longer beat, let alone put to death another because he is son of a slave. The hunters declare, the essence of slavery is extinguished this day. From one end to the other of Manding, raiding is banished and reckoned with this day in Manding. The torments born of these horrors have ended this day in Manding. What tribulation, what torment, especially when the oppressed have no other recourse. What decadence this slavery. The slave has not shown any consideration in this world. The people of the past say, man, in that he is an individual made of bones and flesh, of morals and nerves, nourishes himself with food and drink, but his soul, his mind lives on three things, to see what it wishes to see, to say what it wishes to say, and to do what it wishes to do. If even one of these things is missing from the soul, it suffers and will surely waste away. Consequently, the hunters declare, from now on, each person arranges his own affairs. Everyone is free to do what he wants in respect of the prohibitions. Such is the oath of the Mandan for the benefit of the ears of the entire world. So here is, uh, you have a map of the Mali Empire. Uh, actually, the darker uh, color is the, the area of Mali. And you know, there's variations that to the, the territorial, how the territorial size. The other the lighter color is actually part of Songhai. Uh, and as you see, the Timbuktu, and uh, at this point, Mali uh, had Timbuktu and Gao after Mansa Musa uh, comes to power. And then Songhai is able to take back Timbuktu and Gao. Actually, the Songhai Empire was actually a little larger than the Mali Empire. But you see, it goes all the way to the west coast, to the Atlantic Ocean. Here is a picture of the, the Kama Blonde. This is the sacred house of Kangaba, where the Giabati Jeliu or Giabati Griots get together every seven years and they have this uh, big uh, major festival. They recite all of the creation myths, the historical myths, and it's also a time when it uh, represents the resuscitation of the, the empire of the nation. And it's something they say that people who have been there to see this, uh, where the old roof of the house is lifted off and it's a new roof that kind of just mystically comes back and sits on top of the, of the house. So that's what it's really known for. People are you know, kind of fascinated by that, the Kama Blanc. That's one of the most, again, sacred sites in uh, Mali, in Kangaba. Valkyrie Simono, he was the chief griot or jelly of Mali. He was a person who I spent many hours interviewing him. And I remember Tumani Giabati who was uh, one of the best core players in Mali, he told me, he said, oh, you, you're gonna talk to Bakari Simano? He said, you don't need to talk to anybody else. That's just how much knowledge he had. He knew everything. But of course, you get different things from different griots. 
but he was truly a master and gave me a lot of information. A lot of information in the book is coming from Bacardi Simono, who died a year after I was there to do the interviews. Here's a picture of Jelly, who's also the picture on the flyer. Jelly Jimo Koyate. Notice that they have the spelling J, uh, D I, which is the J sound in French, and they say Jali because they say Jali in Senegal and in, in uh, Gambia, but they say Jelly in Mali. So he's uh, Jali Jimo Koyate, who I also dedicated the book to. He was the first griot that put me in touch with all the other griots. Uh, and of course, he's based here in Washington, D.C., taught at the University of Maryland outstanding, uh, also an outstanding chora fola or chora player. And then this is Siddiqui Giabati. He was one of the first griots I interviewed over in when I went to uh, Mali. It was just for a visit, but I started interviewing griots whenever I went to Africa. Siddiqui Giabati, he was the father of Tumani Giabati, who is the famous chora player and probably the best chora player in Mali today. Uh, Tumani Giabati, and you see him again with the Kora. Now, when I first went to Mali, uh, Tumani was just a little boy, you know, so, and, but then he became my host. I stayed five months at his guest house. He, he never took a dime from me. I stayed five months at his guest house when I was doing the research for the book. Sirimoi Giabati, this is an uh, example. I, I say sometimes they use the word griot you know, to refer to woman, but I just say Master Griot, because she was probably one of the most popular griots in Mali while she was alive. Um, here's a picture of her when she was younger, and you see she's blind, but she was, uh, had this beautiful, deep voice. Some people say she kind of sounded like Big Mama Thornton, but when she sang the history of Mali, it used to just bring the people to tears, and people just would say, oh, they cry when they hear Sir Moore Giabati. Uh, recite the history, sing the history. So she was a master griot, also a master at mediating. There was never a conflict that she did not resolve. And she was very dedicated to solving disputes. So she was master mediator as well. Sir Mora Giabate. Uh, and then these are some of the instruments that are used by the griot because there are certain instruments that are uh, only griots use. Nowadays, you know, everybody's using them, and people are learning the kora and balafone. But during the time of the Mali Empire, there were specific instruments that were primarily used by the griot, and this was one of them, the kora, uh, which is like a 21-string instrument, very beautiful-sounding, harp-like uh, sound. And then these are the sarongs, kind of a, a smaller version of the, uh, of the uh, kora with you know, fewer strings, as you can see. And this is the nguni, which they say was the precursor of the banjo, because the nguni was brought over here by uh, Africans coming from West Africa. It's usually a three-string instrument, nguni. Some people also say, in fact, the Mandinka call it goni. And this is actually a Bambara word, ngoni. So uh, the nguni, and then the other one, of course, is the balafone which is, again, the precursor to the, um, the xylophone. And actually, the piano, if you look at it, you set it up vertically, you know, put the mallets on the keys, you have a piano, too. Something I noticed about the balaphone, xylophone. Okay, and here's, of course, one of the gr famous emperors of uh, Mali, uh, Sundi Adiketo, of course, probably was in people's, in to people of Mali because he was the founder. He's considered the, the greatest, but uh, Mansa Musa certainly was probably the most well-known internationally. And that was because of the uh, pilgrimage that he made to Mecca in 1324. That was his second pilgrimage in which he gave away so much wealth. You know, everywhere he went, he built schools, he built hospitals, he built, built mosques and he was giving away a lot of gold. And they say he gave away so much gold that the world suffered from deflation for the next 20 years. So Mansa Musa. Uh, this also, this picture comes from an old map, an uh, old Spanish map. But this picture was also in the New York Post recently when they had an article about the richest men in the world. And Mansa Musa was on the top of the list. 
you know, and they, they did, uh, what do they call it, the inflation adjustment. But he was number one, the richest man in history, was Mansa Musa. But then I always also wondered, were they talking about his personal riches or were they talking about the riches of the nation? Because they're still mad at Mansa Musa and Mali because he took the treasure, the Mali's treasury, and a lot of sacred icons and gave them away. Right. So that wasn't clear if the article was talking about his personal wealth or not. But still, he was, again, a very wealthy man. Uh, the empire was very wealthy, you could say, at that time. Uh, this is uh, uh, Gundam. This is a, a city in the, in the Timbuktu district. It gives you an idea of the kind of traditional architecture that you had uh, at, the, at that time. Gundam, because the, these are buildings that go back to the uh, 14th, 15th century. And then here's a panoramic view of Timbuktu, kind of a bird's eye view of Timbuktu. You see the similar architecture that you find in Gundam. And then here's a picture of a warrior in the middle and his griots. This is uh, from Senegal. These are Susu. Susu, again, are a branch of the Mandinka people. In fact, the Samanguru Kante was uh, Susu. A lot of the Susus, after the war between him and uh, Samanguru, a lot of them ended up in uh, Guinea. But here's the Susu Grill and his, uh, I don't know if they're his wives or what, but he, you see he's, he plays in Guni. And then there's a Jali. You know from Jali, this is from the western region of, of Mali, from Senegal, actually, a Jali playing the balafone. All right, and these, these are just a few principles I have, and just more details in the book. And again, even in the book, it's just, uh, you know, some of the ideas uh, about Malenke historiography, their philosophy of history. Malenke philosophy of history is rooted in its cosmogony. History is an ongoing manifestation of the first creative word that brought creation into being. So they always go back to the creation myths. History follows the same principles of motion, gender, polarity, dialectics that govern the natural laws of the universe. You know, anthropologists here also believe that and we're trying to find these laws, but they understand this to be the case also, that it follows the same laws. Nothing in history is new. Remember that this, that's a famous saying among African Americans that I think may come directly. It said, nothing in history is new. This is what the jellies will tell you. Every idea, human activity, and event is a reconfiguration of something that took place before. So there's nothing new under the sun, right? Everything's been done before. History's purpose is to teach people to know themselves. That's something else, again. Um, which you find the Griots will say, to know thyself, in other words. Inherent in the thematic structure of history are parables directing humanity to right action and behavior in accordance with the moral ideals of the culture. History serves a spiritual ethical function and is therefore a sacred text. The meaning and message of history are allegories that can be applied to mediate any dispute or resolve any conflict. Thus, the jellies are also mediators. Spiritual forces entity, and entities, angels, jinns, totems, etc., are constantly interacting in human activities and must be accounted for as they actually appear in history. This is where you get the fantastic elements in the history because these things are going on. They've been extricated from Western historiography, but they're still acknowledged in, in traditional histories. Theory and methodology is a few things. The beautiful rhythmic arrangements of poetic narratives make verses easier to memorize and imbues them with an eternal, numinous quality. So again, the poetic narratives is considered superior to a discursive narrative. Aesthetic devices such as metaphor, symbolism, alliterations, rhythm, allegory, imagery, and drama magnify the emotional and spiritual response of the audience and allows them to experience the history vicariously. Oral recitation of history is preferred because writing lacks the warmth, intimacy, and word force in Yama. 
embodied in the human voice. The more Inyama unleashed in the, unleashed in the performance, the more impact it has on transforming human consciousness. Mythic narratives reconnect this audience with the cosmic world and collective memory. And the ritualization of myth allows the individual to relive the historical experience. Genealogy is an essential and inextricable component of a people's history. History should be directed to the individual so that she, he is inspired to eclipse or surpass the deeds of their ancestors. Writing inhibits the development of memory because writing is really a substitute for memory. While trained oral recitation expands the mnemonic capacity, the capacity to memorize, a scribe writes history, but a master historian memorizes it. And that's, 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 that's all I have to say. That's my story. Um, I would like for you to have uh, an opportunity to interact with your audience here. And those of you who have questions, please raise your hand and, and she will respond to you. Yes. Okay, uh, that's a good question. Um, well, for the first question, um, I, I'm not familiar with the instruments used in Uganda, but um, it could be that they come from the same source because I, I didn't go into this in the lecture, but in the book I talk about the origin of the griot tradition and actually they inherited their tradition from the Soninke people, okay, of the empire of Ouagadou, the empire of Ghana. And then the Soninke got the tradition from Sonin, which is in Egypt. And in fact, Sonin is called uh, Aswan today. But the Egyptian name is Sonin, and there's people who still call it Sonin. So Sonin K means people of Sonin. And they migrated from you know, Upper Egypt to uh, the area of ancient Ghana uh, around 100 AD, but they brought their t tradition with them. Okay, so, it, so the lute, right, so that's why I say the lute instruments, right, are probably, again, derived from there. Yeah, and then the second question on Islam, that's a, a loaded question, because um, I talked to the griots about their relationship, you know, because, you know, um, I guess around, uh, probably in the seventh century, you start getting the Muslims coming into North Africa and they conquered North Africa. But one of the misconceptions, and it's a huge misconception, at this particular time, the Arabs that are coming into North Africa are black Arabs, they're Afro-Arabs. They're not what we think of as Arabs today, we're usually thinking of, of, of white Arabs because that's what we see all the time, right, as represented. But if you go to the Sudan, you go to Saudi Arabia, you're gonna see that 80, 85% are black people. You know, in fact, most of them are darker than African Americans. These were the people that the people of Mali Empire encountered. So when I asked them about, what about the Arabs that, that, had, that came in, they said, well, they were just like us. They, they were African people. And there are a lot of lineages, I go into the lineages that come from Saudi, that came, that are part of the Mandinka people, part of the Fulani people, the Soniki, all of these groups, you know, because again, like I said, they're genealogists as well, and the genealogy is not separate. They haven't extricated it from the history, right? So they're considered just their, their brothers. They don't look at them as, you know what I'm saying, the way, of course, now it's a different relationship with the, you know, the, the North Africa. But at that time, the formation of the Mali Empire, it was a good relationship. And in fact, Sundiata Keita, when they talk about his genealogy, if you remember from the epic, where do they trace it back to? His lineage goes directly back to Bilal. He's a descendant of Bilal, who was the first Muezzin of Islam. So you have all of these, now, so they knew about Islam from the very beginning. But you had some of the emperors were Muslims, you know, or as they say, they practiced the religion, did the prayers, and you had others that didn't, you know, that dealt with the traditional or local 
religion that was practiced. So it went back and forth, back and forth. You know, by the time you get to Mansa Musa, he's a devout Muslim from him and his brother, Mandim Bokhari, because I didn't talk about the voyage to America. That's another thing. It's a chapter in the book on Mansa Musa and Mandim Bokhari. But the relationships that they had with the Arabs, you know, and the, the early Muslims was a good relationship. Again, but they're dealing with people who look like them and who were actually part. There are several lineages that actually come directly from Saudi Arabia that part of the Mandinka people. You know, and Sudiata himself comes from Bilal. Now Bilal was supposedly originally from Chad, you know, but again, uh, so they have a, they have very close ties, you know. Yes. Oh. Well, thank you. In fact, uh, Angel uh, was on my, uh, Dr. Batiste, I should say, was on my committee. You know, well, right, was on my committee when I did the dissertation. So, are they, you mean, are they still recording the history orally in a way that they had been doing? Yeah, that, that's another very good question. From what I understand, they, know, they are no longer doing it. You know, it's like uh, the, the title of the book, well, Kuma. Actually, Kuma is also another category of history that refers to Samangur from the time of Samangur, I mean, I'm sorry, time of Samori Ture, all right, who was the one who was fighting the French. And he was like the last to kind of reorganize the empire to the present. But it really ends with some, uh, Samori Ture, you know. The griots after that, after uh, Mali is colonized, the empire is broken up, because now you see it between Gambia, Mali, Guinea, you know, Cote d'Ivoire. There's no longer a tradition of them learning new histories and recording the new histories, which I think is unfortunate. So, but now, I mean, they still have the griots, but now they're memorizing history up until the period of the French conquest. You know, and, and then there's also a movement, uh, this guy, uh, uh, Suleiman Kante, it's a movement to begin to use Mandinka script. Well, he's using, he's kind of created a new script called Unko, you know, like I write. So there's a movement to start using Mandinka script, and then you have the traditional Mandinka script. You know, I don't know how much they're using that much, but, you know, a lot of the, um, Modern griots that maybe come from griot families, but they've you know studied in the West and had their PhDs. Many of them expressed to me that wow, they wish they could have come along and learned what their foreparents learned, because they don't have the memory that their foreparents had, right? Because they're relying on the writing, and the writing is the substitute, right? It limits your mnemonic capacities, so they wish they had learned in the same way. Yeah, so who knows, it might be a movement, but as far as I know, it's not, at least when I was doing the research. Yes, did you my neighbor? That's what I thought, how, how you doing, okay? Yeah, well, it was, you know, the Sonike people, they were the principal traders, and they were mainly selling Mandinka slaves to the Moors to the Moors. These are all, again, African people. And some of the main people involved in the trade, which is why Sumangur was, was angry and wanted to put an end to it, were Mandinka people who were selling you know, their own people. So again, there was an input to all of this for a time during the time that the, the empire was first formed. And this was a time when it was a very, very peaceful place you know, from what has been recorded by other historians coming from outside who recorded and talked about Mali. They didn't tolerate any kind of injustice, but unfortunately it didn't, didn't last very, real long. There were also serious consequences, all right, that came, this was an oath. When people swear to an oath, it's like you gotta keep the oath or else there's serious consequences for breaking the oath, so, I don't know, I look at the millions of us that are over here now, who knows? 
You know, there were consequences for breaking that oath. This has been a presentation of the Library of Congress. Visit us at loc.gov.